I'm Martha Minow, and it is uh, with gratitude to the Berkman Klein uh, team and to Urs Gasser particularly that I say welcome to a discussion that I promise will have answers, at least suggestions, uh, as well as, oh my gosh, what do we do? Um, so fake news is a phrase that now no one is quite sure what it means, but we're all worried about it. Um, and we will spend a little bit of time talking about what do, what do we mean by it, what has it come to mean, but we're going to spend most of the time together talking about what are tools that um, are available or could be made available to help people sort through the floods of information and the democratization of access to information that makes it very hard to know what's true and what's not true. And then, of course, there's not anything new at all about propaganda and lies. We've always had them. Now we just have more access to them. Um, so one of my favorite cartoons shows in the antique world of Xerox machines, someone going to the Xerox machine and making a copy of, of, of something and saying, send it to the world. Now, at the time, that was a funny cartoon. But now, with uh, the internet and digital possibilities, anybody can send anything, basically, to the world. And I think that's the context that we're going to be addressing. Um, I will say something briefly about each person when I introduce them. Uh, and I'm immediately turning to J. Nathan Matthias, who is very importantly involved in the Berkman Klein uh, Center for Internet and Society here. And he's also involved in the MIT Center for Media, uh, Civic Media. And he's a PhD candidate at MIT, and he's going to kick us off. What do we mean when we say fake news? What do you mean? So when people think about fake news, we often look back to that moment when Craig Silverman at BuzzFeed uh, did this amazing report about Macedonian teenagers who were creating fake articles and earning thousands of dollars a month. In fact, one of my favorite fake news headlines is, quote, after election, Obama passes executive order banning all fake news outlets, which of course was itself okay. fake news. Yeah. Uh, but the reality is much more complex. It's much more common to see something like a recent Breitbart article uh, entitled California's Recipe for Voter Fraud on a Massive Scale. There is recent work by Yochai Benkler and the folks at the Media Cloud team here at Harvard that shows that often what we get are kind of powerful political entities uh, creating information that has maybe a kernel of truth, um, but it's really disinformation. They mix truth with familiar falsehoods and kind of logics of the paranoid to make something that is not just believable, but something that maybe when you go to Google, because they're the only people writing about it, you might feel like you're fact-checking it because you see 10 other links from similarly connected organizations saying the same thing, even though it's something closer to disinformation. It goes beyond what can actually be claimed, because in the case, for example, of California, um, you know, their motor voter laws are things that are similar to uh, what other states have already implemented, and there's not really been evidence that those kinds of things lead to uh, uh, voter fraud. So there's this, there's this problem where we have a wide variety of disinformation, and people are concerned about how that uh, information spreads on social media. There are fears about filter bubbles, there are fears about the use of algorithms, whether it's Google's search or whether it's Facebook's newsfeed that might influence how these things spread. And in my research, I've done work to help understand what we as citizens can do and what the public can do to better understand those algorithms and influence how they work for the better. Great. We're going to hear more about that soon. So Anne Chow Mina is an expert on memes. Uh, and she's a writer who looks at global internet and network creativity. And here, as a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center, she's studying language barriers uh, in the technology stack uh, because the interest in diverse communities is a big development of her work. Uh, she leads the product team at Medan, which is building digital tools 
for journalists and translators. And she co-founded Civic Beat, a research collective focused on the creative side of civic technology. What do you mean by fake news? So I think um, when we think about fake news, um, often it's like, this is my perspective as a product manager uh, working with journalists. Um, often in these communities, we, we always you know, we use air quotes, fake news, fake news. And in many ways, this is an implicit acknowledgement that this phrase has come to mean so many things to become almost meaningless. It's an umbrella term for so many other words, um, other, other phenomena that I think we, um, that, so the problem of fake news starts to seem intractable because it is such a diffuse, uh, has a, such a diffuse meaning. Um, and I really appreciate Claire Wardle's uh, a breakdown of fake news. She, she, she looks at different types of fake news, anything from satire and parody to uh, misleading content uh, to really manipulated content and then you know, fully fabricated content, and then also breaks down different motivations, everything from parody to the goal of punking to actually spreading propaganda. And when we look at these uh, different techniques, when we really break down fake news, we can, you know, we can start to think about different strategies and different techniques for addressing um, the wide variety of problems under this umbrella. So I think there's a different range of strategies for when an Onion article becomes cited as fact, um, which is a frequent phenomenon, especially in global contexts where um, a, a, a global newspaper, a newspaper outside of the U.S. might not. Might might misunderstand the context of the onion and then cite that as news versus um, our strategies for dealing with state-sponsored propaganda botnets. Um, so as we break down these, these different, um, these different uh, motivations and techniques, it also helps us think about breaking down our strategies. Um, the other thing about um, their frameworks around fake news is also the, the very word fake news. It, 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 it orients us towards a um, kind of orientation towards truth and falsehood, um, when often the reason that things spread is, um, is um, is not about truth or falsehood, but about affirmation. Um, we, we talk about the, inter in, you know, the internet as an information superhighway. It's one of the early metaphors for the internet. In many ways, it's sort of like an affirmation superhighway. People are looking for validation of perspectives and deeper cultural logics. I, I tend to agree with uh, Whitney Phillips, uh, a researcher Whitney Phillips. Her framework around this is suggesting that we think about it as folkloric news or, or folk news, um, because it, it, it orients us less towards uh, truth and falsehood, which is still important, but more towards motivations for sharing and participation and how that um, reinforces deeper cultural logics. And, and I guess that's my, my third point here, is, is as we think about solutions for this fake news problem, it's also thinking about short-term and long-term solutions. In, in product management, we often think about what is the immediately addressable problem versus what is the kind of long-term issue here. And this, this issue around cultural logics, I think, is an important one to, um, that, that I think about frequently because um, moving beyond um, thinking about fake news as symptoms, as mirrors, for um, for these uh, for um, deeper um, thinking in society for for ways that, that people orient themselves and their values um, helps to think about other civic institutions that we may want to engage um, to uh, to address those deeper logics and um, we can talk um, I'll be you know interested in talking more about that as well. It's fantastic and when you say cultural logics identity is of course such an important factor about that and Absolutely. affiliation. Uh, Larry Bartels has a recent book looking at American politics, electoral politics over the last 70 years and finds that it is not policy, it is not party that explains how people vote, it's membership and identity. Um, and so I think we need to include that, particularly when we think about civic media. So Sandra Cortezzi is our expert in youth and media, uh, and she uh, coordinates the youth and media policy research at Berkman Klein with the UNICEF, an important initiative you know, I was recently struck when uh, it turns out that Common Sense Media has issued uh, its recent study where it finds that a lot of young people act, act, do not know what's news, what's not news, what's fake news, what's not news, and yet they really want to get news. So let's hear from you. Thank, thank you. So um, I would like to particularly highlight two points uh, that, again, uh, focus on young people. When I say young people, I mean usually middle and high school students here in the U.S. And in that context, together with Urs Gasser and other people uh, on the youth and media team, we have engaged in a large qualitative study talking to young people. And so two points in that context. The first one is I think we should look at fake news more in the context of not just what is true and what is false, but more in the context of information quality. Um, acknowledging, so we have done a large study on information quality, very big report, but acknowledging that information quality is first is highly subjective. So uh, what is what you value as high quality information, highly subjective, and that it's very contextual. And 
also important in that context is that we acknowledge that we should take into account that all the different steps in kind of this information process, so not just how one evaluates information once you're confronted with it, but also how you search for it and where you get it, and then also how you share it, you create it, you remix it, and so forth. And the second point in the context of young people, again, we heard it a little bit before, but what news actually means uh, to young people is quite different, actually, than what it means to adults. Uh, through those focus groups, we have uh, learned that young people often have a more kind of social uh, view on what news means, also a little bit a broader um, perception of news. And I think that's then also important when we think about what are the different quality criteria they uh, employ when looking at news. I think that's key to keep in mind in this conversation. So a social view means that they it's affiliation with the news uh, producer, or what does the social mean? Well, social also in the sense of what is relevant to them in their context for their needs, their communities, and so forth, but also looking more at what kind of information slash news they get from friends and people in their networks online, for instance, on social media. So that's, that's great. Sense. That's great. Thank you. So Jonathan Zittrain would be here all day if I said all the things that he does and he knows. Um, <laughs> Uh, but as faculty director of Berkman Klein, as vice dean for library resources, as professor of computer science, and uh, here and at the Kennedy School, uh, one of the many things that you've done uh, is you've actually been attentive to the issues and the risks of filtering. You've done that from the beginning, and that you conducted the first large-scale studies of internet filtering in China and Saudi Arabia. So as we think about fake news, how do you relate that to these concerns? Great question. And those studies of filtering uh, 15 years ago now, 20 years ago, presumed that there was a source of consistent information that, if not true, was respected and that people around the world would want to get to it and that regimes that didn't trust their populace uh, and maybe wanted to mislead them would try to block the populace from getting to that good stuff. And that model, I think, is greatly scrambled now, in part, as regimes have learned, uh, I think it's Zainab Tufeki who calls it a sort of uh, informational distributed denial of service attack, where if you could just pump enough stuff out there, it's really hard to figure out what the reliable stuff is from the non-reliable stuff. So when I think about defining fake news, even there, I, I hope it's kind of an oxymoron to use the phrase, because innate in the original concept of news was that it would bear some relationship to reality. I hope I'm setting the bar at the right level for news. That's not actually saying it's true. It just bears some relationship to reality, both in having some truth value to it uh, and in being presented in some appropriate context. It's really easy to create a mosaic of completely true things that paints a totally false picture. And uh, traditionally, we have relied on or wanted to rely on ask of our news generating organizations that they offer that relationship to reality in that context when they exercise their privileged ability originally through the megaphone people with a photocopier couldn't replicate it um, and with their funding and with their privileged access to speak uh, truth to us and there was a time 20 years ago at the time we were also doing the censorship work when I think there was a lot of celebration in the neoliberal mode of new sources of information. Citizen journalism was a phrase. I think it has since receded, um, maybe because it's now just part of the fabric. And I remember actually a conference about 10 years ago where somebody uh, who was skeptical was like, citizen journalist, huh? Well, next time I need an operation, I guess I'll go to a citizen surgeon and see how that works out. And trying to figure out why wouldn't I want a citizen journalism, but I'm celebrating citizen uh, journalism, a citizen surgeon uh, on the other side. And I do think they're distinguishable, but I would not, in dismissing what maybe previously was thought of as a monopoly of sources, mainstream media often spoken of in a disparaging way, there was a sense of a craft 
and profession to journalism, including ethics. I spent a memorable summer in high school at the National High School Institute at Northwestern. They had something called the Cherub Program, and you could kind of pick your topic, and one of them was at Medill, the School of Journalism, and they really tried to inculcate us recalcitrant 10th graders into what it really means to be a journalist. And there's a lot that has to do with the ethics and the trust placed uh, upon journalists. And whether or not it makes sense to have only a handful of reporting organizations, or whether that's even possible now, seems to me less the question than how much we should value retaining a sense of those ethics and that balance, aspire to it even in the breach. And that just briefly gets to the fake part of fake news. I would define fake uh, also with a fairly um, generous standard as being that which is willfully false. Take aside that which is careless, negligent, got it wrong, gee, I'm sorry, but rather look at the profusion of stuff that the person saying it or repeating it does not to believe, believe it to be true or is absolutely indifferent as to whether uh, it is true or false. And to look at our ecosystem now, we can see reasons of statecraft and ideology to want to propagate false things because the ends justify the means and I have a better uh, goal at stake, perhaps. And uh, under the idea of just it makes me money, the microeconomics of this space should not be underestimated. And it's something that Nate made reference to in his opening remarks, uh, that it can just be extremely profitable to pump out things that are knowingly false and to see them uh, uh, achieve a foothold. And that's part of the problem I think we need to take on if our goal is to have a news ecosystem that bears some relationship to reality and comes from a source that has some sense of ethics or responsibility. Thank you. Well, we're going to turn now to tools. And we've heard people identify the material economic reasons for uh, the problems that we're now encountering and the democratization of access and generation of information, but also on the demand side that the demand is not necessarily for truth and not necessarily for verified facts, but maybe for affiliation, for membership, or dare I say it, rubbernecking. Can you believe this, right? So there's a, uh, Facebook has done an internal study to find out, looking at their algorithms, what gets escalated to the top. And it turns out the vast majority of what we would label fake news that gets escalated to the top was never opened. So it's just the tagline. It's just the headline. So that seems to me, I want to call that the rubbernecking idea. Can you believe this? And we don't even know whether the people forwarding it agree or don't agree or it's affiliative. Look, I see I was right. Or can you imagine that people are saying this? So as we think about tools, who wants to go first? Nate, do you want to go first? Sure, I'm happy to kick it off. Um, so when we think about I appreciate you mentioning these, we might think of them as feedback loops. They could be social feedback loops where the people uh, connect more to people who they affiliate with through misinformation, and that leads them to spread it. So there's a social feedback loop. There are also these algorithmic feedback loops that we might worry about, where then these things become popular. They then become popular by merit of being popular, and the algorithms amplify them further. The first thing I want to say about that, though, is that we need to be able to put the role of social technologies in context. Uh, if you look at the percentage of people who actually rely on um, social media as their primary source of news, it's actually quite small. Uh, Pew did a study where they found that while 7% of Trump voters and 8% of uh, Clinton voters got their like, primary news from Facebook, 40% uh, of Trump voters got their primary news from Fox News and television, and 18% of Clinton voters from CNN. So there's still a, a question about like the role that these platforms play compared to television, radio, and other media. Uh, but companies are doing something about it. We have uh, Google and Facebook both working to, with fact-checking organizations trying to find ways to notify people uh, that something may be unreliable, that it's been fact-checked by a third party. And most recently, Facebook has started testing a system that lets people know if 
the thing they're about to share has been fact-checked and what the, the response has been from one of their fact-checking partners. Uh, I just recently finished a study where I worked with uh, online communities, actual internet users rather than a platform to test the effect of their own fact-checking efforts. Because even as companies uh, try to introduce design changes to improve things, uh, they're not usually very transparent about the effects of those systems. It's very rare for them to publish uh, peer-reviewed research on how those design changes turn out. It's something they sometimes get backlash for mm -hmm. as well. Uh, and so what I've been doing in my PhD has been to support internet users to organize independently to test the, their collective efforts on platforms and on issues like unreliable news. So I worked with a 15 million subscriber community on the platform Reddit uh, who discuss world news. And they had similar problems. People were submitting unreliable news to their community. And rather than outright remove this, they wanted to foster discourse. They automatically posted messages encouraging their community to fact check that information. And we were able to see that not only did that encouragement increase the rate at which people were chipping in to fact check things, but also we were able to see that simply encouraging people to fact check uh, caused articles to be less promoted by Reddit's algorithms. That if you looked at the popularity ranking of those articles over time, uh, simply encouraging people to fact check an unreliable news article uh, demoted that article by uh, four items on average in the top 100 uh, over time. So it's a great example of how you can actually test the widespread uh, effects of these fact-checking efforts and how you may not even need uh, to rely on platforms to do that. It's also about nudges, right? Exactly. Yes. So Anne, tools. Yes. Um, I can talk a little bit about Check, which is the, the platform we've been building at Medan that's been, um, that's, um, been used in a variety of contexts, uh, global, global and, and recently in Western contexts, um, that um, are looking at misinformation ecosystems and how, and it, it's a tool that provides journalists a very structured way to, to gather, for instance, a digital media object, say a tweet that seems to have disputed content, and then to show in, a very, clear, um, in very clear steps what steps they took to research that tweet, the content of that tweet, is it original, who's behind it, what's the motivation for that person, and then cite the sources for those findings. And this is, this is kind of a shift in, in how journalists often work, um, where their, their notes um, are often behind the scenes. Um, and so one of the principles of check is to show the work and show the, the process behind it. Um, this has a few effects. One is for other journalists. Um, check is being rolled out um, in France right now um, with uh, 34 newsrooms and the first draft news network um, in a project called Crosscheck, um, which is helping those newsrooms collaborate together to look at misinformation ecosystems. Um, and newsrooms don't frequently do not collaborate. Um, but in the, in, um, and the reason that um, this tool can help with collaboration is because of its transparency. Um, the, the notion of cross-check allows for newsrooms to say, OK, I can cross-check that, that, and that, um, because I can see the steps that this other newsroom has taken. And so um, in, we're hoping to, um, you know, with this tool, that this helps strengthen some of the news ecosystem in certain contexts where newsrooms typically do not work together. Um, and to encourage collaboration through these kind of open workflows and through structured, structured workflows as well to ensure consistency. Um, within the platform itself, um, there's a variety of different questions, um, uh, you know, those core questions that, you know, that every story needs to, be an that needs to have answered before it actually can become a story and to ensure that that is uh, consistently done because um, especially working in a busy newsroom environment um, where there's breaking news all the time, it can be easy to forget key steps. And so um, the platform tries to systematize that for, uh, for people working together. Um, the reason for this is there's, there's kind of that immediate term use, and there's also kind of some long-term thinking here as well. Um, because uh, the tool is also being used in Hong Kong. There's a, there's a general election, the chief executive election coming up this weekend, and the University of Hong Kong is using the tool in their classrooms, um, in, the, in their J schools, with both journalists and non-journalists, um, and uh, journalist students and non-journalism students. And the goal there, in addition to um, all the other principles I described, is not just to, to help with journalism, but also to help build better journalists um, to this 
notion of, of creating ethics and trust around around journalism um, is to train you know train journalists in the process um, in these kind of new processes of research that are required in the digital environment um, and so um, that that process is going on right now where we're still looking at the results but I was, I was speaking with um, Professor Ann Kruger out at the University of Hong Kong and she's been noting that um, through the process of having to go through all these steps and these checks people start to develop, develop these habits of mind around what they're sharing and then what they uh, um, and how they are articulating what they're sharing online with their community. Even if it's fake, they might be debunking it or are offering rationales for why they're sharing it um, that offers greater context um, to help, um, help with these misinformation networks. And then the longer term goal with the platform is then also collecting data. Um, all, of this, all, of this, all of the information is collected within check. People are adding metadata around this, tags, um, and you know, inf um, information about where the source is, um, what are the motivations behind this. Because ultimately, because some of, many of these techniques are so new and different within a networked environment, um, our hope is that this also fosters, um, you know, uh, provides a set of data for, for longer term research as well. And transparency. That's great. Sandra, tools. Yes, so tools. So we heard a little bit about uh, social tools and then technical tools, but as we are youth and media or I, I work on youth issues, uh, education is one of the tools in this toolbox. And there, I think three points could be relevant. One is how do we actually uh, conceptualize something like news literacy or information literacy or digital citizenship? And how do we co-design projects together with young people so they actually are relevant to them, they work for them, and that the programs bring together the adult perspective as well as the youth perspective. The second one that is important when we think about learning uh, and education more broadly is where do young people actually actually learn? So it's not just in the formal context, but we also have to include informal contexts. So after school learning, how is that happening? And how can you connect the informal with the, inf with the formal one? And the third one that that I think is relevant uh, in the youth context is to also consider what are actually the limits or limitations of media literacy or digital literacy. Because if we think that fake news is also an ecosystem challenge, then it might be difficult at uh, some points, or again, not just then the only tool in the toolbox to put so much emphasis on the individual if it's an ecosystem challenge. Uh, and particularly, again, in my context, on the individuals that are young people, so minors, which are often considered vulnerable populations. So why do we emphasize so much on their own abilities to make sense of all this? One of the forms of literacy education that I've been intrigued by is uh, involving youth in creating news so that they understand the steps and then maybe can participate in some of the social processes Jay-Z, tools. Tools. Well, you opened uh, this round of questions with the observation or the qualification uh, about if news is what people are in the market for. And there's some curiosity about contemporary social media that we don't know what we're in the market for. <laughs> we're just sort of on Twitter and like, let's see what comes up next. And it's a very weird form of one-armed bandit where it's like, news, excitement, dog and <laughs> cat my, usually yeah, right <laughs> more cats please and in that environment you could see people could be online for all sorts of totally justifiable or understandable reasons and uh, if you're there for entertainment being reminded as you're about to share something that like now let's be careful the truth value of it's like enough already I want to share the dog and uh, it, it calls to mind you know, in the United States, in the World Series or the Super Bowl, we wouldn't be like, you know, why do we have to go through this strange contest of physical strength and skill to figure out, possibly injuriously, which is the better team? Can't we have the Patriots and the Broncos just sit down and negotiate? You know, like, let's just figure out some way of splitting the pie. And as good as our negotiation program is here at HLS, like, <laughs> even that might be beyond them. The contest is the point. And I think for a lot of people online, some people are like, I'm trying to learn something. And somebody else is like, I'm trying to crush you because you're on the other team. It's a mismatch of expectation that is not going to end well for at least one of the parties. So already we're, I think, thinking about 
people who are online for information gathering, or even if they're there for entertainment, they may come away thinking they have accidentally learned something that is not true, and that could be socially uh, a problem. So tools. Uh, it's interesting to hear of wholesale tools, tools that could be used within newsrooms as they are on deadline trying to throw things together. I've also been thinking about retail tools. What are tools that could make the experience of typical media consumption and social media usage uh, more amenable to learning if that's what you're there to be doing? And for that, I think there's a couple things. Your point about there's a lot of headlines that are never opened means that it's really easy, for instance, to see a story from the Denver Guardian that turns out to be false about an FBI agent that um, uh, was died under suspicious circumstances and had the goods on Hillary. And uh, if, wholly apart from the facts of the story, whether you want to contest them, there's the fact that the Denver Guardian doesn't exist. Like, it is not a newspaper. <laughs> like, okay, like, at least let's agree there is no Denver Guardian. If you were in Denver, no one would be guarding you. And uh, <laughs> you could see wholesale tools that would at least have, without reference to the content, something about the source. The way that on eBay, for the longest time, somebody selling something on eBay who just joined had shades next to the eBay account, which for years I thought just meant they were really cool. And it's like, <laughs> when do I earn my shades? It's like, no, you lost your chance. You had to be new. But it's supposed to mean they're a little shady. Weird that eBay did that. <laughs> you know, before buying a plasma screen from a shady person, you might want to not do it. Um, so that's the kind of thing you could see a tool being content neutral, but looking at the shape of things, which inevitably, for those who want to spread uh, untruths or lies, then they'll have to game it, but at least put them to the effort of gaming it. Some of the other tools I think would be interesting, uh, Nate already mentioned the interstitial, the fact that Facebook might throw up a thing that's like, I don't know about this, continue? <laughs> like, yes. Uh, there's a famous quote that journalism is the first draft of history. Mm -hmm. It's inevitably going to get a lot of stuff wrong, even before you get into the willful part. And I think it's really too high a burden to think of Facebook or other distributors, intermediaries, somehow being able to fact check in real time. People ought to have a chance to say, gosh, this makes me really upset what I just read and shared, and I feel intensely about it. It would be neat to know a week later, two weeks later, if it turned out that thing wasn't true after the smoke has cleared. And often when the second draft of history is around, things are a lot clearer. So allowing easy tools to learn more about what you heard, I think of it in tort uh, terms, we have product recalls. It's like this seemed like a perfectly good lawnmower with no screen on it when we sold it to you. But on second thought, we think maybe it should have a mesh, so we're recalling it. Uh, maybe we should have a concept of a voluntary knowledge recall, which is not Orwellian, you must forget this, but rather, here's some new stuff we learned since you first heard about this, which in turn could have people learn to be a little more appropriately skeptical as one after another of the stories that all of us have sometimes done. I can't believe that. Really? Jeez, that's terrible. You learn the facts later, and you feel uh, a little differently about it. And uh, I also think, let's look to the future. It's not going to be Facebook and Twitter forever. We are inviting into our homes and our other environments, including sort of our headpieces, the concierge services like Google Home and Siri and Alexa. And we're sort of treating them as oracular sources of activities and news. Here is somebody asking the Google Home, which is like the 2001 monolith in small version, like, on your desk, ready to tell you anything, here's somebody asking if Republicans are fascists. Are Republicans fascists? According to debate.org, yes, Republicans equals Nazis. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, you know, all right, I'm going to go out on a limb. I think that's fake news. And here's, like, in the same level tones of authority that we've learned from the original Star Trek, like, just, it's the implacable march of fact. <laughs> and it would be quite helpful if it's going to do that for these objects maybe to glow a certain color if they don't think they know what they're talking about. They could still give the answer, but it could be like, you know, this isn't as vetted. So that next time, too, when you say, my stomach feels funny, I might have appendicitis. What causes appendicitis? You don't have to be like, because of organic web search hiccuping, it's an imbalance of the four bodily humors and you need an immediate leeching. If you're gonna say it, at least say, I think. 
And there might be ways to signal that. <laughs> I asked you all to, th to identify further questions that you have. And we can talk about that, but it's also my moment to invite all of you here. What questions do you have? And what tools do you have to offer? So before we turn to everyone, let me just uh, identify quickly Libraries, uh, Jonathan, you identified as one, uh, you, you wonder about the role of libraries, and I think that would be a great thing to talk about. And uh, Anne, you said also other physical spaces like museums and schools. And uh, Sandra, you wondered about US versus global, and I think that's a hugely important subject. Uh, and in a kind of variation on that question and what Anne said before, I'm learning that in countries that have more censorship, Having a global network may be important for getting the information, even about a country, uh, by being in touch with people outside the country and, and so forth. And Nate, you, you talked about uh, Karl Popper um, and social engineering. Uh, can you say some more about that? Sure. So many of the things that we've talked about here as tools uh, are interventions that we hope will influence uh, the behavior of potentially millions uh, of people. And there, there are forms of research that we have at our fingertips for doing A-B tests and studying what those outcomes are. And they're important forms of research. But at the same time, uh, we're at this moment where we're confronting the, what it means to use that research power responsibly as we hope for platforms to change things, as we expect the Google Home device to say, I'm not sure. It's responsible to follow up to see, does that actually make a difference? But it's also responsible to ask, who has the power to ask that question? And how can we ensure that that kind of large scale social engineering is carried out in a responsible way? That's great. Um, and I do worry about the infinite regress of the person who is shady putting shades by the entries by others that aren't shady and so forth and so on. So, um, okay, now your turn. And, uh, I, and in the spirit of what we've just been talking about, please not only identify yourself uh, and your source code, but also um, whether what you are saying is an opinion or is a fact or uh, <laughs> something like that. So please, and here, wait for the microphone and just say who you are. Hi, my name is Ron Newman, and I'm somebody who has dabbled in journalism occasionally and helps run a, a, a community blog in my neighborhood. And this is a question. Uh, say you have a, a reputation management system that says, oh, the uh, Denver Guardian doesn't exist, therefore you shouldn't believe it. How is it going to tell the difference between that and the hypothetical uh, Denver Times Herald, which nobody in Denver has also heard of because it just started last week and it's just getting underway, and this is its first big uh, news story? Maybe since I brought up the Denver Guardian, that was for me. It's also um, in federal evidence law, reminiscent of the Daubert case, where judges are asked to assess the truth of something before they decide whether a jury is allowed to see it, for which one of the objections uh, that led to that particular formulation was like, what about Galileo? Like, everybody else disagreed with him, but darn it, he was right. And I think there are, for any system, going to be false negatives, false positives. It's why you'd want to approach it with complete humility. I appreciate sort of Martha's warning about, do we really want to put one of the handful of gatekeepers, uh, uh, the point about Pew and sources notwithstanding, in the seat of deciding what's true and what's false? The thing is, we do need some defense against a very well-resourced and implacable set of lies from some state actors and other sources. Like, I, I don't think, we ought to be, have humility about any tools we build, but I don't think it should mean we shouldn't do anything because there is still going to be a shaping and structuring. Whether you've heard from that Denver paper is going to already be structured. So I would at least say, Put the shades next to it. It's the first week of the paper, but you know, maybe it's its big scoop. It could be. Feel free to read the article, but have that grain of truth and then wait to see if the grudging and failing New York Times <laughs> is like, I should have had that story, but I guess I'm now going to have to must credit Denver Daily Telegram because they broke it. And then you'll hear it from the Times as well, and you'll hear it from Fox News. 
So just to add, uh, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sure, sorry. Just to add to that, I think also um, a certain transparency around the logics of the system can also help. I think um, mm. the uh, you know the shade icon part of part of what. Um, what works is that if you trust that eBay has a logic for that shade icon, and, and the logic seems to be that it's a new, it's a completely new account. Um, so making a clear logic for the um, for the design language that we are communicating about X Y Z source, um, so that people can dig in and say, okay, what what is the logic behind this? Why why did this happen? What are the reasons for this? And makes a clear distinction between a site that has knowingly produced f um, false information for years versus a site that it, it just come up just popped up a week ago, um, and therefore we think you know you just might want to double check this. Um, so I think showing that can, can help um, along this path as well. So the great thing is that there can be more information. And as you said before, it can be over time as well. So you can click on that icon and get some background. Why is that here? And then somebody can adjust it over time and have more feedback. Please. Hi, so I'm Benjamin. I'm from the Kennedy School. So I have a question for Anne. You mentioned a lot of transparency. And I'm wondering, good journalism seems to me exists with some level of op opacity. Right, you trust an, a name source, yes, exactly. and you have you, you you trust the journalists to have this ethics around it that Jay Z talked about. Right. So I'm wondering, how do you balance this f need for extreme transparency with the idea that you know the media is fourth estate because there's a privileged space for it because you trust yeah. journalists, yeah. and does that actually dilute some of the prestige that we accord to journalists? Yeah, absolutely. And th I think there's a broader conversation here, of course, that about declining trust in media institutions. And, and when we talk about transparency, there's transparency of all the notes. Um, of every, you know, all the sources. I think a lot of journalists are concerned about maintaining, um, you know, some kind of privilege, especially with their sources, especially sensitive sources or sources from underprivileged communities. Um, but there's also a transparency around process and um, and checks. And so I think when we talk about transparency, we have to talk about both of these things. Um, that sometimes there's a reason a journalist has to protect a source, but frequently when someone says an anonymous source said X Y Z. They don't indicate why that source has to be anonymous for um, for X Y Z reasons, um, and so showing a transparency of process. Here's a decision making process we 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 went through to decide whether or not um, to declare the 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 name of this source um, can um, hopefully um, can hopefully help build trust because um, a lot of the process um, of this kind of sausage making behind a story is often hidden um, be, because there's this assumption that people might understand what that what that looks like, but often um, the, the general public do doesn't really get to see what work you know the going on behind the newsroom and so I think that's one that's one way to, to kind of break down transparency let me put the library question what what role could libraries play well libraries at the moment seem to be one of the handful of institutions in the United States still retaining a lot of trust and good feeling from a huge swath of the population <laughs> Like, it's hard to think of any other major institution that comes close. Now, you might say, that's a bunch of capital. Let's not spend it down by getting into the fake news wars. And there's some sensibility to that. But I actually think that to the extent that libraries represent a profession and a set of values that overlap greatly with the ideals of professional journalism, whether or not they're met in day-to-day -day practice, uh, the idea of a librarian whose job it is to help you find what you're looking for without judging your own question, guarding fiercely the privacy of your having asked that question, because curiosity is to be treasured and the pursuit of knowledge should not be uh, uh, something that you feel shame about and that you could be made public, very different from what a typical search engine, which too often has replaced sort of the reference desk, uh, may not be embracing as much. Mm -hmm. And I could see ways in which uh, librarians are ready to offer kind of human effort, not looking for the technological shortcut all the time. <laughs> and that could complement the technological shortcuts that Google and Facebook and others are racing to introduce to help us grade eight that which we see. So my vision would be for you see something online and there's a button you can press that says, I'm really curious about this and I'd like to know more about it. And if a threshold enough people who aren't habitual button pushers press the button about that, it like appears in the inbox of one of the librarians around the world who volunteered to have a look at it and maybe even to have a discussion group with some other librarians to actually kind of get to the bottom of it. It's a distributed Snopes. And Snopes has its own fans and detractors now. They're in it. They are part of the news story. 
Uh, but having a distributed set of folks who stand behind their own research, who are citing to sources rather than speaking ex cathedra uh, or out of their own purported substantive expertise, their expertise is meta. It's about finding the source, weighing it. What a great opportunity to involve the treasure that is our world's professional librarians in this process, get them interacting with people who are curious. And it's the kind of thing I would hope, say, Sandra would discover, uh, that kids would be interested in participating in as well. I think it's a totally reasonable eighth or ninth grade assignment mm -hmm. to spend a day in the trenches of validating stuff and share it with your teacher in your class. What a great thing to do with our kids. And I mean, additionally as well, what I think is great about libraries is that they bring communities together. So it's not just a space you would go if you want to have a trusted a piece of information or a trusted librarian. It's actually where people come together and debate and discuss. So I think that's equally important about libraries, uh, particularly in Colombia, where I grew up. There are many great examples of libraries playing a key role in fostering dialogue among people with different views. Great. It's kind of a neutral place. Hi, I'm, I'm Paul Lippi. This is a question for Jonathan in his role as a taxonomist. So it, it seems to me that potentially the scale of this problem is not that big. So if you just did an 80-20 of how many stories a day represent 80% of all stories read, what, what do you think the number of stories is? And is there a classification system that exists to you know, define and control the text of the story so you could say this is X story? Because if you have those, then you can probably come up with some kind of system that's not controlled by the walled gardens, but the walled gardens kind of implicitly have, yeah. have a taxonomy of those stories. Well, I can certainly see where you're trying to go with that and how carefully you're trying to thread the needle of giving what are our de facto gatekeepers, and increasingly so, like Facebook, um, some role to play without giving them such arbitrary discretion that they are kingmakers uh, of fact. It points out how helpful it would be to be able to collect fulsome data about the spread of memes. It's the kind of things we were hearing about for Media Cloud, our project here, being able to watch how stuff happens. So it might fit your instinct of a power law where 20% uh, of um, the fake news in the world is what's hitting 80% of the people. And there might even be ways to track it, kind of like in the stock market, you apply the brakes when everything's the bottom seems to be falling out. Without waiting for people to click the button to say, I'm curious, you could say, gosh, this thing is taking off like wildfire. Send the librarians after it to catch up. And uh, if that's the case, what is the Mark Twain quote? Lies are halfway around the block by the time the truth is finished putting on its shoes. Um, this is helping the truth put on its shoes a little bit, or at least, again, offering the context if people are hungry to have it. And there, too, again, I think about, like, in uh, 1984, the two minutes hate, that it was part of the instrument of that state to get people up and riled about something for two minutes and then on to the next thing. And there's something that may appeal to us about it, uh, not to our better instincts, perhaps, but uh, there has to be a hunger among people to want a little bit extra beat of the rest of the story that makes the original story less interesting, less shareable, less exciting. It does seem that working on this demand side is absolutely critical, and we may be hardwired uh, to be intrigued by and f uh, fearful about and excited about things that are horrifying, and not so hardwired to be interested in good news or complexity or something like that. And so how to cultivate a desire that may be counter to our biology seems pretty important. Yeah. Paul, did do you, you had a... You don't have your mic anymore, though. Okay. It's so not okay, so hold on a minute. Okay. Thank you. I'm not, I'm not super sanguine about the, the cognitive problem of what people are hungry for, but it does seem to me if the world is mostly, on any given day, 200 stories that are broadly not fake and 20 that are fake, and that's the total population, it, that, if, you, if the problem is of that scale, the nature of the solution may be easier than it feels like. It might be, but it's again, it's just not a snapshot. This is a moving picture. And for instance, among my desires for the ecosystem uh, of information, 
I actually want to see fewer gatekeepers or a broader range of them. And for a Facebook, I want to take Mark Zuckerberg at his word that they're a technology and platform company, not a content and media company, and say, great, why then only have the Facebook feed tailored to you in a secret yes. way with no transparency, as On points out, but rather let anybody develop a recipe for a feed, and then I can choose to have my feed driven by the National Rifle Association and uh, Ralph Nader, which would be an interesting feed. Um, <laughs> but if that aspiration is met, it may mean a longer tail of stuff, and suddenly it's harder to find those top 20 stories. In fact, there's a, a greater dispersal of stuff. And, but, but with the snapshot of today, you might be right. It may be easier than we think. You know, we're, we're getting, I think, a question about how much do we know? And there's a real need for more research yes. to even know what the scale is and also what it would take to make it possible for people to express what they want yes. and that maybe more people want to be able to customize their their feed and if that were clear and facebook hasn't asked that question then that would be relevant to facebook and others yes and do you want to say something yeah i think i think just to, to build on this this notion of, of looking at the feed it's also to remember that a lot of um what we call fake news spreads on non-feed based platforms um including private platforms and email, um, and then also just through in-person networks. And so um, the, our research methodologies also need to adapt uh, for this. Um, the, the ability to search the API for WhatsApp is not possible because there's no WhatsApp, uh, there's no WhatsApp API. Um, and yet WhatsApp is a critical platform for a lot of rumors and misinformation in a context like India. Um, and then you have Kakao Talk, a private network in Korea, um, and then you have a WeChat in China. And so the methodologies need to adapt, um, and, and also our, our comfort with um, knowing that it's unknowable because of how these things spread on private networks as well. Um, and so our, our focus on the feed is important, but at the same time, um, understanding the other ways that these things spread and um, uh, is also very critical. The history department here now is encouraging people to do work on the history of rumors. I mean, there's a, a, something we can learn historically, too. I heard that, too. Yeah. <laughs> Way in the back. So, oh, Grant, let's for a moment... Say who I'm, you are, please. I'm Peter Meekros. Thank you. I want to grant the benefit of the doubt of technology. Let's say we have a perfect technology that can perfectly identify fake news. Why would anybody actually use it? You have people in the general population who go to entertainment media, be that television or Facebook, basically to be entertained. They, go, they see out places that reaffirm them. News sources are uh, incentivized journalists to put out articles as quickly as possible. Uh, Saying I was wrong, New York Times publishes an article, if a week later a person gets informed you read something wrong at the New York Times, that actually undermines its credibility. So, so just come to the point, what's the question? How do you actually get tools like these to be adopted? Why would people use them okay. given market dynamics? Thank you. Thoughts? So that, that sounds like the uh, demand side question again. And there, uh, it does get back to what are people doing when they're online? And I think it's often a sort of vague hanging out a lot of the time. Um, there are elements of gamification to it. If Twitter tells you how many followers you have, people pursue more followers. If it's a blue check, people want the blue check. And uh, when we think about the tools for dialogue, uh, which are remains to me surprisingly quite crude across multiple platforms, and to use Facebook again as an example, uh, is sort of how many likes or shares did you get? But it would be interesting if there were a button that said, I want you to know I disagree with what you said, but I'm really glad you said it. Like, respect, but not agreement. Um, I think we could figure, I don't know what the icon would be, like, <laughs> I'm confused. Um, but you're not confused. You're just having a subtle thought. <laughs> it's that you like that it was said, but you don't agree with it. I defend the death. You're right, right to say the, it. The Voltaire button. Yes, so it's a Voltaire button. <laughs> and <laughs> if that button existed, people would actually start to post stuff that accrued Voltaires. And that would be pretty cool. And you could see people then wanting to reach people beyond those who agree with them and having some crude measurement of success at that. And you then might find that that demand creates a certain supply. I think it's quite protean. And this does not seem to me to be like Orwellian mind control. It's like there already are the buttons that are there. You have to have buttons. It's worth thinking about what are the buttons going to look like. 
So can I can I add something yes, to that? Yes, please. I, I think there's a there's a temptation to enter into this almost like um, I don't know if any of you know the the classic Atari video uh, game Missile Command, yes. where there are these like missiles or like these aliens coming down, and you're like panicked, and you're shooting all these missiles to stop the like alien invasion. And I think there's a, a tendency sometimes to treat like complex social issues as if they're like spam or other like like well-defined technical problems with a very specific like high impact technical answer. And you know, Jonathan, when you were speaking earlier and you talked about libraries, you were drawing attention to the kind of deeper currents at play. Right? There, are, there are, there's been declining trust in institutions. Um, the news industry itself has had challenges staying funded. And on top of that, there are a variety of actors who are investing resources into um, making that mistrust grow even further. I think about a, a study that was just published yesterday that asks the question, are trolls to blame for the problems that we've been seeing? And Biela Coleman, Whitney Phillips, and others wrote this masterful article pointing out that whatever you know, trolling culture may be doing at a given time, there are these wider social trends that we need to be thinking about even as we think about the Voltaire button, how do we actually support the uh, like social uh, institutions like libraries that we need to kind of build that trust over time? And certainly platforms will play a role in that, mm -hmm. but they won't be, won't be the only answer. And share the joy of the dialogue, the discovery, the correction, the rediscovery. I, I think to many academics, it's kind of core to academia, to be found out that you were wrong about something is like a great day. Yeah. You're just like, that's so interesting. I thought X, it turns out not X. Right. Now, if you were like not that careful in saying X, it might also be a little embarrassing, but if you'd kind of dotted your I's and crossed your T's and you still got it wrong, it should be how interesting. And to be able to share that joy with people early and often and have that be part of the fun of being online not for everybody, not all the time, but there's surely more of that rather than aiming towards an oracular fact-generating machine. That's true. There are times when if you ask Google Home like for pie, it will tell you the value of pie until you tell it to stop talking. <laughs> and you're probably not like, you don't want it to be like, okay, get out a piece of paper and draw a circle. You're like, no, no, I don't want to derive pie. Just tell me what pie. I actually just wanted a piece slice. A slice of pie. Yeah, that's, right. that's true. <laughs> that could be as well. Um, which would be a terrible misunderstanding by Google Home. Um, <laughs> but uh, many more of the topics that we are concerned about and that factor into who, for whom we would vote, how we would think, how we look at our neighbors, those are things that really are great candidates for the dialogic dwelling upon rather than just the oracular answer, is this good or bad? Urs Gasser. Thank you so much. Great panel. A quick observation. It's so interesting talking about the different tools we have in the toolbox. We covered technology. We talked about social norms approaches. We talked about the importance of market forces. And yet in the background is law, right? The fourth modality of regulation. And we didn't yeah, talk about it right at all. Us. So <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So the question maybe even to the moderator, if I may, does law play a role in all of this and not only in the restrictive version in the uh, constraining version as we recently see in Germany with the Network Enforcement Act uh, requesting um, social media platforms to take down content that is clearly legal actually interesting merger between hate speech and fake news there uh, within 24 hours but maybe also enabling law that clearly shapes uh, where we stand today. Uh, these are legal decisions that these platforms uh, have enabled. So is there a role of law to play as the fourth mode of regulation in the Lessig framework? So this is the beginning of our next event, I'm sure. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, it's just important for us to shine a light on how law is underneath all of these structures and what's permitted what's enabled, what's encouraged, what's reinforced. Uh, there's a legal framework for the social engineering. There's a legal framework for the cultural and civic institutions. And so I think it would be a very worthwhile exercise to spotlight, to highlight uh, what law is enabling, what it's preventing, 
uh, and what it could do uh, to promote the development of more tools along the many dimensions that we've talked about here. Please join me in thanking this wonderful panel. Thank you.